Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome back to Watchbox. And of course, watches tonight. Tonight we have a trend that must end. Silly thoughts about candidates and prospective watches. We will offend everyone, naturally. And of course, sports watches that make great dress watches because the dress watch genre is dead. Everyone wears a sports watch. Why fight it? All of that and viewer wrist chats tonight on Watches Tonight. Of course, there is no better place to buy, trade, and sell watches than the watchbox.com, the people who pay for these pixels and this new studio. The watchbox.com, especially when you're looking to sell, we make it easy, we make it quick, we pay immediately, and if you are looking to trade up or buy, I have a new direct email, the purchase and pricing question line for you to me and my hand-picked crew, tmasso at the watchbox.com, for all the watches you see on Watchbox Reviews and my Instagram. By the way, Join me on Instagram, Tim underscore Masso. Hey, why not? 50K in 2K20. First things first, guys. You above and beyond. Let's see who is first. Alexi Samola of Finland. Good man. McKinley Stevens, Bud to Stud. We've got BBQ. We've got Chi Town, California. We've got ooh, Turkish Meister, our friend from Turkey. MCC, Richard K, Emily N, joining in from Halifax, Canada. And then K Kyle and Richard Combs, our good old friend from South Florida, and Mez 944. Jeffrey Rosen, my old neck of the woods, Syosset, Long Island. Okay, let's see your wrist shots. Starting out, the images you send to me, your machines on my machines. John K of Hong Kong is a matchmaker with a lovely Zenith steel bracelet on a Roger Dubuis Sympathy 39. That's a really sharp combo. That looks factory, and if not, it should be. Russell K of the UK and the UN Freak kick back with a potent potation, nicely framed, and a real landmark watch. That is the Ur watch of our era in terms of technology. Uh, Gordon C and his JLC Reverso Duo share an autumn shot from last fall, also nicely composed, excellent light, excellent color, warm, humane. Mike P in his Black Bay 58 chill in Omaha, Nebraska, the great American Midwest, a lovely loom shot to get us started. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. All right, jumping into the box right here, we've got Andy Paxton from England. We've got Brian K from Maryland. We've got Paul T saying, hey Tim, hey Paul. And then we've got Marshall P joining in from Fort Lauderdale. Simon Holt joining from Hollywood, Northern Ireland. It's funny because Fort Lauderdale is a twin city with Hollywood, Florida, and that was our old Watch You One headquarters. Thomas Burnett joining in, present and correct. We've got Ball joining in, and we've got B and S, Hale Bop, Simon N. John Doe, please no Rolex. That should be the 2020 re resolution. Well, in a sense, that's sort of a theme of one of our features. Jumping right in, guys. Marty B asks, have you any thought of more trends that need to end? I liked the original, will there be a sequel? Well, I did trends that need to end a few months back and there were quite a few of them. I don't have enough ammunition to fully load the magazine, but I've got enough for a short. And I think the trend that needs to end, and we're in burst fire mode here, is I've been meaning to revisit this Complaining about the Rolex aftermarket and dealer wait lists, there is nothing more to say. This is a huge preoccupation of YouTube channels in the watch space, and I think it's just about time we lay it to rest. At this point, no one is truly shocked or appalled because this has been going for, what, three years now, folks? I think it's time for all of us as a watch community to move past this. And it's time for those of us truly exhausted to start offering alternatives and helping to light the way out of this for the watch community. All of which to say is there are too many awesome watches available now from countless brands for those who have the patience and the passion to look a little bit deeper. And I think this is where the trend will end. Let's look at the alternatives. You can now get the Blancpain 50 Fathoms 5015, which is a true high horology watch. Not just a high horology diver, but a bona fide high horology watch, finished inside and out. You can get that for less than what people are paying now for no-date subs. And while we may revisit the no-date sub a little later in the show, my point is you could have this. Why not? Let your friends know. Spread the word. I have a growing belief that griping about Rolex markets, wait lists, and markups is actually exacerbating the problem and driving wait lists and those markups. I think we just need to stop feeding the beast and eventually we will get from here to there. Yep, 
We love Steve McQueen in the watch world, and that was an original. By now, there's little doubt that lamenting Rolex hype is one and the same as hyping Rolex, and we need to just close the door and move on. Next chapter. Jumping into the box, we've got Joseph, we've got Nen, we've got M. Wayne 5, and we've got Jacob Casper joining in from California. And I see we have John Doe saying, Rolex makes a million watches. No way you are achieving hands-on finishing. I believe the only manual work on Rolex watches is when the movement is serviced, when it goes back, and when a dial is assembled. There's still some manual finish there. Pretty much everything else automated. All right, Yeti saying, rubber straps need to stop being considered premium. I understand. And then Pete asking, Tim, what do you think about the new Moser Streamliner? I think it's original. I think it's sharp. I think it's just about the right size. They got the water resistance right. I like the fact that it looks like a union of an old Seamaster bullhead chronograph with the 1970s Omega lobster tail bracelets. It's very sharp, looks nothing like the others in the space. And unlike Longa, <coughs> Dizius, they got the proper interplay between lug and bracelet. Proportional, handsome, and I believe enduring. This will be one of the best looking watches from the era of the integrated bracelet sports watch, not a Me Too piece. Jumping back in, guys, viewer wrist shots, you're in the game. Let's share some names. Andreas H. of Germany is on vacation in Portugal with his Seiko SKX diver. Raphael C. shoots a dramatic nighttime shot of his Rolex GMT Master II and Imperial Power in the background. Michael L. and his Rolex Explorer have impeccable taste in online entertainment. And Larry D. of Chicago and his Omega Seamaster, this is the Omega Seamaster Railmaster, framing the former Sears Tower. He sent me two black and white in color. I figured for the artists in the audience, why not go with the B&W? Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watches on this box. Question from Raphael T. in Iowa, skirting controversy here, Raphael. We are holding our first in the U.S. caucus tonight, Tim. Can you match the candidates to watches? While I generally steer clear of politics on this show, I have often preyed on politicians for the sake of humor, and I think I can navigate this one without offending anyone, or possibly simply by offending everyone. Here goes. For tech entrepreneur Andrew Yang, a Devon tread, to symbolize our inevitable obsolescence at the steely hands, or in this case, belts of machines. For former Vice President Joe Biden, here shown, accepting the key to the city of Atlantis, no doubt, an Illinois Bun Special 60-hour railroad watch, no doubt he would relate given to him by Casey Jones himself. For the presumptive Republican nominee, U.S. President Donald Trump, the new $48,000 Omega Aquaterra Ultralight, the only Omega watch built to play endless rounds of golf. For former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, an Omega Speedmaster Moon watch, white side of the moon, technically accomplished and impressive, but perhaps just a little too white. For Senator Amy Klobuchar, yep, that's her right at the end, any Arnold and Son, a credible option that everyone overlooks in favor of the usual suspects. For Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, a Vacheron Constantin Medicus Doctor's Chronograph, which she will immediately trade in for a Seiko caliber 6139 after voters are outraged by the price. For former New York City mayor and billionaire Michael Bloomberg, a Grubel Forsey GMT quadruple tourbillon for each wrist, because he can. And for Senator and self-proclaimed socialist Bernie Sanders of Vermont, a sundial. No comment. Jumping into the box right here, we've got friends joining from far and wide. Justin Cooper, we've got Clive Watch Wrangler, we've got Bob, we've got Joseph, we've got Geezer, Beauty of Scent, and a longtime follower in Brick Lane, also a longtime follower. We've got Abdul R of the Black Forest in Germany, and we've got Zinn Master, a fellow fan of Zinn Spezialuren. And then we've got Pete's Time Peace Safari joining in, and we've got Sergeant and Yeti. And we've got a question from Yeti. Are you working from home tonight, Tim? Almost. Our new studio is 0.7 kilometers from my actual house. It's going to improve 
work with me, guys. Bear with it for the moment. Big things are coming. And then we've got Brick Lane saying Putin likes his watches too. True, but as far as I know, he's not yet in the race. Jumping into the box, we've got Simon Holt saying, I wish the IWC Spitfire had deployant. Any thoughts? Sure. It's the premium version of the IWC Pilot's Watch Mark 18 and chronographs as well. It should have a deployant by all rights. And then we've got Charlie joining in from Lincoln, England. And Ten May likes the sundial match for Bernie Sanders. All right, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program. Uh, this is a feature where I think I'm going to match sports watches to dress attire. Not necessarily specific outfits, but the idea of wearing a sports watch in dress attire. At this point, it seems like dress watches. Proper, petite, thin, yellow, rose, platinum dress watches are almost starting to seem as anachronistic as pocket watches. It's just not where the market's going these days. And as we increasingly see high horology dress watches, of course the usual suspects from the likes of Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, the Vacheron Generation 3 Overseas, now Alanga Unzona, and for that matter, even Grubel Forsey is getting into the game. It seems increasingly like the dress watch is no longer necessary if you are going to go black tie with a watch. Now, I know my European audience always tells me no black tie with a watch, but here in the States, we do things a little bit differently and admit it, you want to wear a watch all the same. So here are a few of the best sports watches to cross-dress with suits. That didn't come out right. Rolex Submariner, no date. The 114060. This is the current, no date. Uh, $7,900 watch in theory. Yes, there is a markup for this one pre-owned, but it's not crazy like the GMTs and Daytonas. Figure around nine grand to pick one of these up secondary right now. I'm also gonna say it's an option with legs. If you did pay eight or nine for one of these today, I don't believe you would be in the same kind of imminent jeopardy as the people who are paying 2x at the moment for Pepsi, GMTs, and Steel Ceramic Daytonas. And technically, there is no no-date sub. There are Submariners, and there are Submariner dates. And technically, this right here is called a Submariner. I'm also going to say that this is a cleaner look for the sub. When you remove a date from a Submariner dial, you also remove the Cyclops eye. And while the Cyclops eye is functional and practical and does a great job of magnifying the date, some people also feel like the sub is one three-hand dial away from perfection. And for those, there is this. Now, it's also important to note the rarity. You will not see one of these in your Rolex heavy office because people inevitably go with the sub. And if they've got more money or time on their hands, they go with the green sub. Plus, this is technically identical with the exception of the date, meaning you get the same movement, chronometer certification, water resistance, ceramic unidirectional bezel, and critically, you get the glide lock bracelet with the 20 millimeters of two millimeter incremental adjustment. So you're not giving up anything in terms of diving capability, but you are going to have a somewhat more exclusive sub and a wonderful match for any formal attire. The look of the steel and the black dial to say nothing of the bezel is absolutely killer, and at 40 millimeters and about 12.6 millimeters thick, wearable on any wrist and under any cuff. Admirable for a hardcore dive piece. Jumping into the box right here, Geezer saying the 114060 is legendary. Russell 996, my man from the UK saying, love that sub. Damien Ross saying, would love to see a no-date Hulk, but that won't happen. Don't be so sure. I've theorized that perhaps the third green Submariner could be a combination of the original Kermit and a no-date. Think about it. Super case, green ceramic bezel, black dial, no-date. How does Rolex go for its third generation anniversary sub now almost 20 years after the first anniversary sub? Well, let's not forget there's a big anniversary coming up for the 70th anniversary of the sub in 2023. I would not be shocked if the next generation green sub is a fusion of the No Date, the Hulk, and the Kermit. I'm not saying I know anything, just it makes sense and it would be a game change for that model. Jumping into the box right here, I see Abdul saying, I think a nice dress watch is not a bad thing to have. And will I agree? I'm just trying to find a way to reconcile market trends with the need to have something to wear with formal attire. And a lot of folks are solid sports watches these days. We got Chai Town saying, Rolex Oyster Perpetual 39 white dial for a summer linen suit. And then we've got 
Emily N saying, I'm currently eyeing a vintage Yema diver, much more character than a Rolex sub in my opinion. I also think it's interesting if you're looking at a vintage Yema diver to consider a Yema Yadengraf because those are very cool vintage regatta timers and they are rare, they are special, they are distinctive, and they have a little bit of a following behind them in a way that some of the Yema divers don't specifically. All right, and then right here we got Pete's timepiece safari saying, all the same, Hulk for me. Now jumping back into our schedule of dressable sports watches, the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Satin Stainless, also known as the 100 meter. Now this has just come out and it's everything the Octo Finissimo was back in 2017, but it's one critical thing that was not highly water resistant. 100 meters and still very thin. You're not giving up anything. 5.25 millimeters thick, still 40 millimeters, and with a credible caliber 138 high horology movement on the inside. That's a rose gold case in a different model, but it's the same movement. Big at 36.6 .6 millimeters in diameter, but only 2.23 millimeters thick with a platinum micro rotor and a 60 hour power reserve. This Bulgari Octo Finissimo 100 meter is pretty close to perfect but it's still very new. So with a retail of $12,000, you're probably only going to find these at dealers right now. Because it's a Bulgari, let $12,000 be the starting point for negotiations, not the end. Omega, the Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch. Let's recall that nothing dresses up nice and two-tone like a penguin, quite like a moonwatch. Now this is a timepiece that was unfathomably huge at 42 millimeters in the mid-1960s, but it's almost as though our tastes have grown into it, or it's grown into our tastes on a convergence path from the era of oversized sports watch status to now something that you would easily pair with an office suit. This is a watch that is incredibly clean, balanced, and sophisticated with the steel Speedy Pro featuring a simple balanced three register dial, no nonsense, white on black print, an elegant, anodized aluminum bezel that surrounds the dial and visually extends it, the lovely off-axis distortion of a plexiglass, and of course, all on a bracelet, this is perfectly suited to the tastes of our time. I will also say that this is a watch you can buy on a bracelet new for $5,350, and it's worth mentioning that you can pick them up used on a strap for as little as $3,500, and nothing goes better with a suit than alligator leather on a moon watch. That would look incredibly sharp. I almost feel like with that watch in the catalog, Omega doesn't even need dress watches. For the same reason, I think a yellow gold sub with an integrated end link and a strap should just be what the Cellini collection is. No need to force it with dress watches. So again, good value, handsome, timeless, and increasingly in step with the tastes of our time, the moon watch has never been more relevant. Jumping into the box right here, I can see we've got all sorts of friends far flung. Bird saying, can't go wrong with a Seamaster daily wear or special wear. And then right here, I can see Kevin S saying, Omega Globemaster on a bracelet. I considered that one for this feature, but I recently featured that on our highly water resistant dress watches. And because the Globemaster is technically a Connie from the Constellation family, I consider it to be a sporty dress watch rather than a dressable sports watch. We are splitting hairs here. And then right here, we have Pete saying, Speedy goes nice with my carbon cufflinks. That is sharp. I need a wrist shot of that. Please make this happen. Monday mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Jumping back into our program, Vacheron, guys. The Vacheron Constantin oversees self-winding. It's how Vacheron describes an automatic. The first two generations of the overseas were fine, but they were not quite the apex predator ready to go blow for blow with Patek and Audemars. With the generation three, that changes. This is now the best high horology sports watch you can buy. And yes, I am considering the Longa Odysseus. I'm also going to mention that I have to admit, this is the model I would choose in this feature. If I'm putting my money up for one of these, it's going to be that guy. So 41 millimeters by 11 millimeters thick. It's nice and low and slides naturally under the cuff. You can see my Zin is not really built for such things. Fortunately, the Vacheron is. Low slung, elegant, and with two straps that come with it. You get one in leather, you get one one in rubber, and of course the integrated bracelet. You get all three plus a spare deployment for the straps when you buy this watch. Now you get many options too. You get the brown dial option, which is probably how I would choose mine. There's also silver and black, which you can have with stainless steel, or the blue, which is probably the crowd pleaser and the most popular option. 
And remember, you get those accessories with the watch. There's also, for the first time on the overseas, a display case back. And the display case back is worthwhile. Caliber 5100, automatic winding, five position adjustment, 60 hour power reserve, Poinçon de Genève finish, exquisite, and still just as anti-magnetic as the solid case back generation two. Rather than having a shell around the movement, there is a paramagnetic ring around the movement. So still 25,000 ampere per meter resistant and 150 meters water resistant you are not losing anything in terms of resistance or durability with that display case back. And how much do you love that triple finished engraved 22 carat compass rose rotor? This is the works and note the quick release underside mechanisms to the lug. All of which is to say, this thing is the full package for $18,900 new. And you can find them pre-owned for as little as $15,000 if we're talking a 2016 out of warranty with really no compromise in condition. So let the, be the bidding begin at fifteen dollars and you're getting Geneva Hallmark High Horology, a true Nautilus killer that pound for pound, dollar for dollar, and feature for feature has to be considered a better watch in most respects. Jumping into the box right here, we can see Richard Combs saying, I prefer the VC Dual Time Generation 3 with the blue dial. Good point. That's a nice watch. Question from Mads about the Chopard Alpine Eagle. I saw it in Dubai. I have to say the dials are all that and more. The best part of that watch is the dial. Uh, between the 60-hour power reserve, the chronometer certification, the 100 meter plus of water resistance, and the quality of the case finishing, it's probably the best Me Too watch of the moment. Yes, it does accurately reference the St. Moritz watch of the 1980s, so in a real sense, it is drawing on Chopard's real sports watch history, but let's not forget, back in the early 80s, that watch was back then a contemporary of and a Me Too derivative of the Royal Oak, the Laureato, the 222, and of course, the Nautilus. All of which is to say Chopard has done a good job advancing the state of the art in its bootleg style. A great watch, but one I believe as a Chopard and a derivative you should purchase pre-owned. But make no mistake, the quality of the movement, the dial, and the finishing in the of the case and the bracelet will not disappoint you. I just think, as with the original Chopard Pro 1 sports watches, this one's going to fall off a cliff used. Great watch by its secondary. And then right here, we have uh, BW, BUW Sir saying, Boo Sir saying, the Odysseus looked nice in a YouTube video I saw, and then Bud to Stud saying, Milgaus is a giant killer. I actually have to agree with you there. If you're going to get a sports watch to dress up, I don't know if you're going with the Z Blue on that one. You're probably going with the white or the black dial, but an awesome choice. And it's one of the few Rolex models that wears true lug to lug because the end links don't project beyond the case. Plus, you get that low profile with the non rotating bezel. It's a more refined look, it's a lower profile look, it's sleeker, it's more more elemental and of course you have that three hand no date dial that caps the assembly. I think that's probably one of the best dress watch sports watch crossovers at the moment. Sports watch first, make no mistake, but easily amenable to dress considerations. Now let's talk about Emily N. I, I see you had a comment. I missed the prior comment. Just rephrase that. Emily N is saying the Odysseus better than the overseas anytime in my opinion. Valid theory, of course, the granular appeal of that blue Longa Date 8 dial is compelling. I'm going to have to compare them side by side before I can make a formal judgment. But for now, having seen the overseas in all of its versions, advantage Vacheron. John Doe asking, where's the Generation 2 overseas? Well, where is it superseded by the 3? If I had to recommend one true, you'll get a better deal on the Generation 2, but the Generation 3 is a better watch. And then Richard Baker asking, Tim, El Primero Day 521 worth buying? Yes, but the one I would choose is probably not the one you would choose. The open dial is the one the market tends to prefer, whereas I feel like the new Range Rover or the Panda dial, the solid Panda dial, are the ones to own. Check out the 250-piece 2019 Range Rover edition, which feels like a a more balanced, subdued, one might even say suitably British take on the Defi El Primero 21. Also, be sure you're comfortable with a 44 because it's a big watch on the wrist, even if in titanium or ceramic, it is quite light. Now, advancing the state of the art in the world of vintage re-editions. This is more art, perhaps, than science, but the JLC Tribute to Deep Sea 
Euro dial. This is a watch that came out in 2011 and there were two versions. There was, of course, the US dial, which was LeCoultre signed, and there was the Euro dial, which said Giger LeCoultre. Now, the Euro dial was made in 959 pieces versus 359 for the US. So while it's not the investment option, if you're looking for the rarest thing, no modern JLC is really an investment watch anyway. 40.5 millimeters. It's an ideal size for a modern dress complication. And of course, the wrist fit is graceful. You can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, this one really hunkers down. And with a squared off vintage inspired lug profile, it doesn't overhang. Nor is the case unduly thick as that vintage thin mid case profile makes it look thinner than it really is. I'm also going to say figure on eleven dollars to $12,000 to own this watch. Of course, they're all used and they've all been sold at this point. Get one full box papers with the accessory secondary plexiglass crystal because these came from the factory with two. True to history, it does feature a thermoplastic crystal and it's got it all. Loom, rarity, a great brand, elegance, the convenience of an alarm, and 100 meter water resistance. This is one of the coolest watches you can get if you want to cross the border between a sports watch and a dress watch and use the former as the latter. Jumping into the box, real time right here, we got Ian K saying, looking at Omega SMP Breitling Super Ocean and Super Ocean Heritage in the Tudor Black Bay. There are things I like and dislike about each one. Wondering if come Basel, I'll see some new options. Probably, I think you'll see some detail changes, but realistically, the most desirable version of the standard Diver 300 meter is probably gonna be the ceramic. I think overall the ceramic no date, though a bigger watch at 43.5 with ceramic and titanium, it wears light on the wrist. I also think if you're going to get the Tudor Black Bay, uh, you should look for one or two. Go for the Black Bay 58, which has the in-house caliber in the thinner case, or go get the like six month Black Bay Black with the ETA caliber. That's the one to own if you want something that's a little bit rare, a little bit of a cult watch, and maybe has some legs down the line as a collector's piece. Otherwise, I think Black Bay 58, SMP Ceramic, or maybe even consider an Omega Planet Ocean 39 Ceramic. The black ceramic version of that is the best Planet Ocean. Surprisingly wearable and one of the only Planet Ocean watches that doesn't look like a diving bell on your wrist. As for Breitling, nothing wrong there, but I do think that if you're looking for a Tudor movement in a Super Ocean, you may as well just get the Tudor. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, now we're going a little bit upscale here. There is a Patek Philippe Nautilus, but it's not the one you're expecting. Patek Philippe Nautilus 3700 1 AJ or 11 AJ. Now, respectively, they made about 200 of one and 600 of the other. All of which is to say these are scarce watches and the original Nautilus 3700 in any of its form is a bona fide grail and a safe place to put your money. But if you want a sports watch that you can dress up, there's nothing wrong with going for a little bit of 1980s two-tone. It's appropriate, it's a wonderful period piece, it harks back to the original Gerald Genta monoblock case, which was so much thinner than a modern 5711, there is no comparison between the two. We're talking about 7.5 millimeters thick with the original JLC movement. And of course, you've still got that 120 meters water resistant, provided the watch has been recently serviced. You've got the high horology movement. You've got the same standard of fit, feel, and wrist presence, but you've got something that's not the commodity watch that the 5711 is. There are literally tens of thousands of 5711 and more coming every day. So if you do have the money to go for a Nautilus and go big, go for an older one. Go for a 3700 and get the one that you rarely see, even among 3700s. The blue dial, the yellow gold, and the stainless steel. You'll be getting an original. And of course, if you really want to go big or go home, I recommend you go big. Get one with a full boxed set. The earlier examples would feature the legendary cork box, but even if you wind up with something like this from about 1983, you're going to have the ultimate Patek Philippe sports watch collectible that, yes, at 7.5 millimeters thick, will easily and appropriately wear underneath the cuff. Right here we have, oh boy, we have Amin saying, hi Tim, hi Amin, thanks for joining me. And then we have Lee V saying, reminds me of the Rolex Datejust 2 of the date just two-tone of the 1980s. That's true. Back during the 1980s, it, you were a baller if you were wearing a date just two-tone, especially on a Jubilee bracelet. And right here we have Marcus saying, 
is communicating to Brick Lane, another one of our viewers, I want to pull the trigger on a 50-50 Grand date, but it doesn't have a bracelet, so I'm holding back. You know what? If you want a bracelet on a watch, always get the bracelet. Never buy it in, as an accessory. Ruinously expensive and a diversion not worth pursuing. And then right here we have Bud Destud saying the two-tone 3700 looks like a Miami Vice Nautilus. Very nicely phrased. Okay, jumping back into our program, we've got Breguet, and this is the last of our dressable sports watches. The Type 20 3800 Naval. Now, right there you can see a true tritium dial 3800 from the 90s on my wrist in steel, and it's a handsome piece. There are many options, tritium and luminova both. Many dials, many cases. But the modern Type 20 launched in 1994 as the 3800 Aeronaval without a date and the 3820 Transatlantique with a date. This feature concerns the former. 39 millimeters in diameter and only about 46 millimeters across the wrist. This is a watch that is not just very dressable, but very wearable. With a coined case and teardrop lug profiles, it has an elegance that you don't often find in sports flyback chronographs. The rose gold model with the lacquer blue dial is to die for. I don't know if we can go full screen with that, but that is a very, very sharp look. And again, those two exist in the era of tritium as well as luminova. And the tritium adds a particular warmth alongside the blue that makes these absolutely delectable and particularly collectible. Finally, there is that 90-piece platinum model with a salmon dial. And if you're gonna own just one Breguet Type 20 that's not a true vintage service issue piece, this would be the watch. And again, combine that with tritium and you've got an absolute jaw dropper. I mean, that dial, wow! Holy smokes, guys, and only 90 of those made. But with titanium, steel, gold, platinum, many dial designs and dial colors, bracelets or straps, you have many options. And on titanium and steel, these tend to trade for between five and $6,000. So this is a very accessible point of entry into high horology and Breguet. Jumping into the box right here, we got a lot of friends. We got a lot of folks, we got a lot of viewers. You have made this episode a success. Abdul saying type 20 with tritium dial on a bracelet. That would be his choice. Thomas Burnett saying Aero Naval. And then Kevin S noting that good deals can be had on type 20s and that is absolutely true. Finally, bump, bump, bump. We have Emily N saying, oh, that is a sexy Breguet. Guys, your watches, as I like to say, your analog on my digital. Viewerist chats, starting out with Marcio M of Maastricht, sharing his IWC pilot's watch and piles of commuter bikes in the background, warming my heart and my wrist. Chaz M and his Air King 5500 are looking sharp with an aftermarket strap upgrade that just works. Nice ink too. Chris L flies with water wings and an Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean at the National Space Center in the UK. Marceau R stuns with his spectacular Omega Blue Side of the Moon Aventurine dial. Guys, I can't top that, and based on the wrist shots you sent me, neither can you. Send your wrist shots to mondaymailbag at thewatchbox.com, and if you have questions about buying a watch from us, prices, terms, accessories, condition, pricing and purchase, tmasso at thewatchbox.com for all the watches you see on Watchbox Reviews, our website, and of course, my Instagram. Guys, Thank you so much. This was a hell of an episode. I read all the comments in the chat box after the show, so don't worry. If I didn't acknowledge you, I'm going to. Also, comment below. Let me know. I like to interact after the show. Time out. Tim out. Thanks to my crew that made this new studio possible, and thanks to you. Thanks for logging on.